Hotep family, Kaba Hiawatha. Uh, this is um, a continuation of some of the episodes that we have been doing over the past week or so. I, I wanted to get a little bit more in depth with uh, what is episodic history, what is corrective history. I, I, I also wanted to look at the uh, neurons of the brain because that concept is very important to talk about in terms of our experiences and what we experience every day as we're learning and the role that learning and the styles of learning have on our being able to do something with the things that we're learning. And then the final piece that I'd like to do is to wrap up the concepts of the neurons, the episodic and corrective history. And I want to talk about some of the work of Dr. Uh, Shekhanta Jyot, where he talks in his book, uh, Civilizational Barbarism, he talks about the um, importance, he, he, he creates a question, why cultural identity? It becomes a very important concept to understand. Why is this important? Uh, having been in the Board of Education as long as I've been with our children, from kindergarten straight through college, some even postgraduate, the question becomes why? Why is it important to know who you are? What is the purpose of it? You know, how is it going to advance me? One of the fundamental questions, and it's a good question, uh, because everyone should always ask, how does this apply to me? What is its importance to me? And so I'd like to wrap up with certain concepts and then look forward into the future as we go into this series and we, we further our understanding of what it is that we want to talk about. One of the first things that I want to do, and um, I normally just talk this way, but because of the nature of the correctness of, of how I'd like to present this information, uh, I, I ask you to please understand because I'd like to read some things to you because I've got some definitions that I want to talk about. I, I want to define episodic and I want to define holistic education and I want to define what is corrective history. And to do that, I need to put my attention here just so you can understand and also for the record because we're, we're going to post this. So, you know, us doing this live is one thing, but you'll be able to go back and see it and maybe take notes on this, um, you know, to really understand what we mean when we say episodic history. Uh, and in my research, the way I look at episodic history, I look at the word episode, which is really the base word. Uh, episodic, an event or group of events occurring as part of a larger sequence of events. It's an incident or a period considered in isolation. It's very important. Synonyms, words that mean the same as episode, incident, event, occurrence, happening, occasion, experience, adventure affair, interlude, chapter, a finite point or period in which someone, something, or some event is affected. And the purpose of episodic history is to examine and analyze a person, a place, or an event. Just to examine and analyze holistic or corrective history is characterized by comprehension of the episodes of someone, something, or some event as intimately connected and explicable or explainable only by reference to the whole. The treatment of the whole person, the whole place, or the entire event taking into account the mental, physical, spiritual, and soulful factors rather than just the episode alone. It's when you're dealing with the whole thing. And a holistic view means that you are interested in developing the whole brain. The purpose of corrective history is, to, now look at the difference. I'm gonna repeat it just so you can see the difference between the two. The purpose of corrective history is to analyze the person, the place or the event comprehensively and determine what can be done for the person, place or event to be better or to be corrected. Episodic history looks at an episode, its part. It has its place and it is important. But corrective history looks at the entire series of episodes with its purpose to do better. It's corrective history. 
it's not just analyzing. I know I use the example of World War I and World War II. What could have happened right after World War I that could have prevented World War II? So the idea that we're doing is that we're studying the past in order to improve for the future. And that's a very important aspect because I'm a social science teacher. And I know that when we taught the American Revolution, we taught the people who were involved in it. We taught about the places uh, where it took place and we talked about the events. But we never had, and I'm not saying that all teachers were like this, but the way the curriculum was structured, it wasn't meant to correct. In other words, what could we have done um, during the Vietnam War conflict that would have avoided Afghanistan or would have avoided Iraq? Uh, so you're looking at things from a corrective perspective. The reason why this is important looking at our history as a people is because we are introduced to the African-American experience. But in no way, shape or, or, or form are we introduced to the many other episodes we are not introduced to the fights that took place in Africa when the communities were invaded. We really did not get into the understanding of what happened in Elmina dungeons. We didn't talk about that. All we talked about were episodes of an experience. So therefore, children who are being taught that slaves were brought from Africa, slaves were not brought from Africa. Human beings were brought from Africa and they were enslaved. A slave is a noun that describes a person. But to be enslaved is a process that a human being went through in order to take and to oppress them, which is one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit later. The next thing that I'd like to do, understanding episodic history and understanding corrective history. And, you, know, I, you know, I can give you another example. You're watching television and you're watching a, a, a series on TV that comes in, let's say, 12 episodes. You, you get a chance to see the first episode, but you don't see the other 11. Do you know what happened? There's no way you could know what happened. You only saw one episode. Let's say that you, didn't, you missed the first 11 and you saw the 12th episode. Do you really know how the 12th episode came into existence? How the things that you watched in the 12th episode actually happened? No, because you didn't see the other 11. Third example, let's say you missed the first three and the last three and you saw the middle six. Do you know how things began? Do you know how things ended? No. So in order to understand what has happened to us as a people, you have to understand all 12 episodes. You have to go back into Africa. You have to go back into the origins of life in Africa. You have to understand how Africans came into existence. What were their experiences? What was the geography of their experience? What, what was their history? Who were they? What did they accomplish? What languages did they speak? What were their values, their interests, and their principles? We know that, for instance, in Medunetta, the language called hieroglyphs, by the Greeks. We know that the letter M, the M sound, is depicted by an owl. But look, I'm, I'm here in South, South Bronx, okay? <laughs> I don't see owls. So how could I ever understand the meaning of the owl in Africa when I live in South Bronx and I have never seen owls in the South Bronx? Maybe the zoo, but I haven't seen owls. So. How do I know their values? How do I know their interests? How do I know their principles? How can I come to conclusions about what the truest meaning of being African is if I'm not exposed to that experience, that value, that interest, and that principle? What were the values of their foods, their hygiene, their nutrition? These are all episodes. We can have an episode on African nutrition. We can have an episode on African language. We can have episodes, but the question is, in what way does that episode reflect the totality of a people of which we have not yet seen? So that's why episodes and corrective history as a direction to where we're going is extremely important. So what I'd like to do is I'd just like to show you this. This is a picture of a neuron. And in this neuron, you're going to see the different parts of it. And basically, there are a number of parts to the neuron. But what I want to do is I want to break it down into the dendrites, which is like in the front, they're branches. Then you have the soma, 
the cell body. And then connected, you have the axon, and then you have axon endings, or, or, or what's called axon uh, terminals. Now, when you have these concepts, and you look at the, um, the uh, movement of the axons and the dendrites and the, the way in which messages are sent, this is another picture that I've, I've put together, particularly for this particular event, just, just to give you a better sense of what you're looking at. When, when you're developing what it is that an, a, a neuron is, it becomes very important to be able to understand that. Because right now, as you're watching and you're listening, what you're actually doing is you're taking in concepts, you're taking in understandings. And what's actually happening is that messages are being sent from an axon to a dendrite. It goes through and it goes from one cell to another cell at what could be considered astronomical speeds. There are three different ways that messages are sent in your brain. All of this is important to this overall conversation that we're having because our entire experience as a people, and I could even go to other cultures, this is how all human beings, in fact animals also, operate this way. But because I've noticed that in my, my lecturings and in my visits and my conversations with people, unless you understand this part of the brain anatomy, it's very difficult for us to understand what position we're in, how did we get into this position, but most importantly, how can we get out? And what it calls for is what I call reassociation. Because right now, as you are putting, well, imagine this, imagine you're in Africa, your home. It's a home that you've been in all your life. The people that you know, you've known all your life. You see them and uh, you eat with them and you run from, from home to home. Their children are your friends, um, their parents are your parents' friends, their grandparents are your grandparents' good friends, and you all are working together. Throughout your entire life, you create what's called associations in the brain. Your neurons are being connected, and they are creating associations. As these associations are being created, they're linking in your brain. They become tight links that you can see, that you can know. Now imagine somehow, some way, an event occurs where someone comes in and snatches you out of that world that you've grown up in, that you've lived in, that you've known all your life. Imagine that. And imagine a whole new set of livings and understandings and people that you see and experiences that you have. Go from one of love, trust, understanding, justice, it goes to almost hatred, pain, suffering. What is actually happening in your brain is that your brain literally is reassociating. But before it's reassociating, it had to be disassociated. So what's happening is all those memories that you had in your community are now being ripped away. And they are being reassociated into a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of functioning. And throughout this entire enslavement process that African people went through, there was a, uh, there was a disassociation from what you knew and a reassociation to what you began to know, which was harsh. And in your brain, what's happening is that even though those, those terminals, those memories are ripped, they're never taken away. The very nature of those memories are tattooed. They are built into your head. They're there in your neurons, in your DNA, but they are suffocated by this other experience that you're having. Now, imagine what's going to happen when you begin to be exposed to information that is reminding you of what that experience was when you were home under those loving conditions with the people that you knew. Imagine what happens to your brain. So what's going to happen is that you are going to begin to reassociate. You're going to reassociate what you had associated in the beginning. Memories are going to come back. 
the neurons that are being connected, they're going to be taken out and brought back into their original terminals. When you begin to understand certain things about yourself that you didn't understand before, that deep inside of you, I, I know I've spoken to people before and they say, you know, brother, what you dropped on us tonight, man, I've always felt that. It was always in me. I just didn't know how to say it. But somehow when you were saying it and when other people were talking, it brought full circle what it was that I've been feeling all of these years, but just couldn't put words to. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Those memories will never be lost. Those memories are deeply entrenched in our DNA, in our memories. And one of the things that would be the greatest challenge to the conditions that and people who wish to oppress us would be for us to be able to reassociate what we associated, to remember the time, to understand what it was that we did, and to develop a way of living that brought us back to that point. However, we have to superimpose the reality of the 21st century. It's all right to go back to the past, but you got to go back to the past in order to prepare for the future. So it's important that as we go back, as we go back to the universal principles of Ma'at, when we understand truth and justice, reciprocity and balance and harmony, that we do it with a 21st century state of mind, that we understand that all that Imhotep did as he was an engineer and a poet can be done again but in a 21st century of mind. So it becomes very important that as we do this and we move through this process, that we understand, and I'd like to end with this, Dr. Sheikh Ante Diop, great Senegalese scholar, in his essay, In Civilizational Barbarism, says there are three things that people will take from you when they wish to oppress you. They will take your history, they will take your language, and they will take your psychological factor. And as the great scholar Dr. Leonard Jeffries tells us today that your psychological factor are your VIPs. They are your values, they are your interests, and that they are your principles. When someone wishes to oppress you and they take your history, and they take your language, and they take your values, interests, and principles, that's the first step in oppression. The next step in oppression is for them to superimpose on you who they wish to oppress, their history, their language, their values, interests, and principles. And in so doing, whatever decision you come to in your life can never be in your best interest because your neurons aren't connected for you to be looking through your own eyes. So the decisions that you make are not going to necessarily be in your favor. So as I see us, the way in which we conduct ourselves, I'm not surprised. What's, what's happening is quite natural, considering natural people are in an unnatural type of situation. And so when we meet again, I want to talk to you about history. I want to talk to you about the value of history. I want you to understand that it is said that even if you have a bad history, it's better than not having a history at all. And so it's important that as we do this and we move forward, family, I, I, I told you I was going to be getting my tech skills together. I was trying to get this, and this is just such a, a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to do this. And uh, I just thank my son, Heru, for being the technological genius that he is to assist me in doing what it is that I have to do. And I just thank my audience, my grandson, Caress, uh, for being here uh, to support what it is that we have to do as a people because my son and my grandson are our future. And it is our job, it is my job in particular for my children and grandchildren to make them better than me. And I remember my father used to always say, I wished on my son what I should have done. And I've been trying to carry on in Booker T. Sr.'s footsteps in understanding what it was that he was trying to do. And family, we have to continue this. So as I come to you, I will come to you in these 20 minute, maybe 15 minute uh, slots, episodes, but I want you to be looking at this from a corrective history perspective. Episodic history, corrective history, the neurons, and the three things that people take from you when they wish to oppress you. We will continue for the next time. 
and we're going to look at history and we're going to get deep into history from many of the great scholars perspectives as to what is history and how it can best serve us moving forward have a great Saturday family have a great weekend I wish you all the best tune in to www.kabakamene.com k-a-b-a-k-a-m-e-n-e.com download my free e-course on my next book spirituality before religions because that's another conversation we have to start having and with due respect do respect to all those so family keep on keeping on it ain't over till we win hotel Hotep family, Kaba Hiawatha. Uh, this is uh, episode uh, two of series one. And um, just to refresh where we've been, uh, we spoke about uh, the difference between episodic history and holistic history or corrective history, uh, which is to be able to study our history from the vantage point or from the viewpoint of correcting what has happened in the past. It's very different from the way in which we look at history now. We also looked at the fact that episodic history normally, if not always, is taught correctively so that you can have episodes within the corrective approach. Within the holistic, you do have the episodes. And so episode is the part, holistic history is the whole. And um, we gave examples of the study of the Moors uh, in order to understand 710 to 1492 after the Christian era. It's important to understand the Mediterranean and the Africans, the Kushites in the Mediterranean. We looked at West Africa and we saw that in order to understand the ancient kingdoms that we look at, such as ancient Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, it's important to be able to look at um, the uh, river that existed where today the Sahara Desert is, there was once a very lively system that had animals and fish and people and trade and communications uh, for thousands of years. But somewhere around 5000 BC, this river, the Taman Raset River, began to dry. And out of that came dooms, desert of what we today call the Sahara. But these are episodes that tell the whole story, so you can see. And uh, we often look at our experience as African Americans uh, when we study just our existence during the enslavement process, we have a problem. And that problem is the fact that that's an episode in our history. But who were we before we were captured against our will, brought here, held in bondage to work? Who were we? Where did we come from? What had we achieved? up until that point. So episodic history, corrective history is very important. So as we do these episodes, uh, you're looking at it from a, a much larger perspective. And each week we just kind of do a refresher briefly as to where we've been. The last time we were together, we spoke about the three things that Dr. Sheikh Ante Diop in his book, Civilizational Barbarism, speaks of when he talks about what a what will be taken from a people if they if another people wish to oppress them. And we came to the conclusion, according to Dr. Diop's research, that the three things that they will take is your history, your language, and your psychological factor. Dr. Leonard Jeffries tells us that a psychological factor comprises your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. In this particular episode of this series, we want to now look at just history. We want to talk about history. We want to study it and understand what it is. And to do that, I want to take uh, two different documents. One of them is Dr. Diop's work in the essay that is, comes from the book on barbarism, uh, and it's called How to Define Cultural Identity. And I want to also take another document that uh, Professor Dr. Yalenge, a brilliant scholar, he is the one that translated Dr. Diop's book in Civilizational Barbarism. He is the one that translated it from French to English. Dr. Yelenge also created a workshop series. And I know because I um, saw and was, I wasn't necessarily a participant of, but I had a class in the same place where Dr. Yelenge used to have his, his class, 
where they studied civilizational barbarism. It is a phenomenal piece of work, which all of us should have in our libraries by Dr. Sheikh Abdel Diab. But Dr. Yalenge created a study guide uh, to begin to look at Dr. Diab's great work. And I want to take excerpts out of his document as it related to history. And I want to bring them both together with a with just a, con a coming together of a lot of other concepts. But what, 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 what is history? And of course, now the history I'm talking about is not the history that they put on us. You know, we tell things like it's his story and our story and us story, and I understand all that. But what I want to talk about is the phenomenon of what history actually is. And I'd like to, uh, to be exact and uh, to be able to give to you the information from the primary source, which is Dr. Diop's work, I just want to read a couple of things. Uh, but here's Dr. Yelenge. I'm going to go between Dr. Yelenge and Dr. Diop to give you a sense of what these two great scholars are saying. In uh, Yelenge's uh, piece, he's, he says about defining cultural identity. Dr. Diop defines the cultural identity of a people as being the collective personality of that people. In other words, identity equals personality. He goes on, and a people's cultural identity then is what can be demonstrated to be the personality of that group of people when looked at collectively. Individual cultural identity is a function of the cultural identity of one's people. An individual may not claim to belong to a group of people, which usually is a result of ignorance brainwashing inferiority complex if they don't accept the collective reality of that people they may say they belong to the group but if they do not follow the the collective consciousness of that group what dr theofalio benga student of dr diab calls a cultural common sense they really don't have a right to claim that um, they can belong to the group but they cannot claim the identity of the group because they have strayed away from it so that what you're looking at is what we all call ethnicity. And Dr. Diop breaks down cultural identity into these three factors we spoke about, history, language, and psychology. Yalenge says any action planned, premeditated, calculated, or otherwise taken on to the above three factors, history, language, psychology, can result in the cultural personality or identity of a people becoming modified, reinforced, destroyed, or created. Anyone who is of the mind to destroy a people, to control a people, or to redeem a people must first carefully study the above three factors, then plan what type of action to undertake to achieve their intended goals. Dr. Diop says, for every individual, his or her own cultural identity is a function of that of his or her people. There are these three factors that contribute to this collective personality. Perfect cultural identity corresponds to the full and simultaneous presence of all of these three factors, the history, the language, and the psychology. As a people of African descent, wherever we find ourselves in the diaspora, for us to be perfectly intact with our cultural identity, it means that we must be aware of our history, our language, and our psychological factor. And Dr. Diop says that um, there are specific combinations of all possible cases, individual or collective, where one factor functions fully, another has a very weak effect or even none at all creates a situation that is lacking of that perfect cultural identity. Now, let's look at Dr. Diop's definition of history. Those three things we did was a carryover from our last class. It was a discussion, again, about what, where we left off last time. This episode, we're going to look at the history. Our next episode, we're going to look at language. The following episode, we're going to look at the psychological factor, the values, interests, and principles. But let's look at the definition of the historical factor. Dr. Diop says, one can say that a people has left prehistory behind from the moment that the culture itself becomes conscious 
of the importance of the historical event to the point where it invents a technique, oral or written, for its memorization, accumulation, and implementation into the culture. The historical factor is the cultural cement that unifies the disentangled, the disjointed elements of a people to make them into a whole. History, by the particular expression of the feeling of its historical continuity, lived by the totality of the collective people. In other words, the idea is that we all have a collective history. I am born, raised, New York. I've just come back from Louisville, Kentucky this past weekend. I spent time in Hopkinsville, give or take 170 miles southwest of Louisville. A different time zone, yet same state. As I had fellowship with our people in, in Kentucky, I being from the north, they being from the south, there was a collective experience that we had. There were things that were very common between the two of us. Uh, there were things that when I looked at them, I said, that's very much like me. There were things I did that were very much like them. There is a collective experience as black folk. We can then even take that further out and go to uh, Puerto Rico or to Brazil or to Costa Rica, who this month, by the way, in Costa Rica is Black History Month. In London, Black History Month is in October. But there is a collective understanding of the, of the returning back to our roots to understand who we were before this ma'afa. And so there is a collective, a cultural unity of African people worldwide, wherever we're from, whatever language we speak. In, in Holland, we express ourselves through the Dutch language, but it's an African experience. In Cuba, we express this African tradition in Spanish, in Haiti, in French. In Brazil, we speak uh, Portuguese. Uh, you can go around the world. In Sweden, African people speak Sweden, but there's an African consciousness. There's a cultural unity. This is what Dr. Diop is saying that we have to go to. And that is what Dr. Clark meant when he said Pan-Africanism or perish. Pan means whole. You bring the whole group together. So it's all Africans coming together, Pan-Africanism. He, um, Dr. Diop says the, the um, essential thing for people to rediscover is the thread that connects them to the most remote part of their ancestral past. In other words, the further back you go, the more intact your understanding of who you are. It's like a, a slingshot where you, you, you have that, uh, that projectile that you put in and you pull back. The, the objective of a slingshot is to project something in front of you, far in front of you. So imagine taking your mind, your consciousness, your understanding, your intellect, and that's the projectile that you put inside of, of your historical uh, slingshot. What you know is that the further back you go, the further in the future you're going to project yourself. So in corrective history, we're not going to the past to, to stay there. We're going back in order to project ourselves forward. That becomes very important for us to understand. Our ancestors did a phenomenal job on the pyramids and the temples of Kemet. They did phenomenal jobs with the Monomotempan Empire in Southern Africa. They did a phenomenal job in West Africa. We're not going back there to live there. We're going back there to take those universal, powerful principles and bring them to the 21st century in order to have our children be able to move us forward as a people. So we're going back to go forward. We're going to the past in the present in order to be able to go further into the future to project what it is that we would like to do. So the erasing and the destruction of the historical consciousness also has a very powerful impact and can allow others to take those people into uh, colonization, enslavement, and basic the debasement of the people themselves, for them to look at themselves <clears throat> as less than who they really are. Uh, you can do that when you take someone's history from them. Dr. Diop says, even, well, for instance, I'll just read it. 
He says, a people without a historical consciousness is called a population. The loss of your national sovereignty and of historical consciousness following a prolonged foreign occupation engenders a stagnation, a standing still, or even sometimes a regression, disintegration, and a partial return to human barbarism. Dr. Diop says that even a bad history is better than no history at all because at least you have a point of departure that you can now project yourself to. And so it becomes very important so that when we get to the 1609 or 1620 or 60, whatever people want to say, and it's almost like the birth of African people, well, what is our history? And if that is our history, that we were born to be enslaved, why should we be surprised if we conduct ourselves in a slave mentality way. So it becomes important that we understand that, as, as Dr. Diop tells us, that um, how do a people build a great civilization and then fall? So it becomes important for us to understand these things. And Dr. Diop says that our African history should be looked upon on two levels. Number one, he says the local history. A, a local history is a deeply lived, segmented by diverse exterior forces and principled by the one experience that they're having, which for us is enslavement. For Africans on the continent, it's colonization. And what happens as a result of that, if that is allowed to continue, if the lack of knowing your history continues, it will shrivel up and you will literally live in a vegetated state. Uh, you, will, you will live totally unaware of who you are, doing the bidding of other people. He says you also have a general history, which is more general. Further off in time and space and including the totality of that people, it comprises the general history of Africa. Research permitting the restoration of it, the history, from a purely scientific approach. That is why family, you, you, you hear me say frequently um, that I'm coming from a scientific perspective and not an emotional perspective. Uh, I, I want to activate your neurons for you to connect it from a point where it makes sense, where everything that you're doing step by step is making sense to you and not that you're just accepting it maybe because the person speaking uh, sounds, like they know what, sounds like they know what they're talking about or maybe the person is someone that you want to believe or maybe something that they're telling you is what you want to believe. So you accept it. But scientifically, if you take the scientific approach, you will know what you know because you will have step-by-step -step methodology that allows you to understand exactly who you are and what you are as a people, but more importantly, where you have to go. So what becomes very important is that um, all, of the, all of Africa's history is reevaluated according to a new union or holistic standard suited to revive and to cement on the basis of the established fact all of the elements of the ancient historical experience as a people. It becomes obvious that the feeling of historical unity and, con and consequently of cultural identity that scientific research is capable of providing at this time for the African cultural consciousness. It allows us not only to qualitatively understand the superiority of African culture and what it has achieved, but it also allows us to look at where we are right now, what we can do moving forward. And this emerges a direction of commendable research for the reinforcement of the cultural identity of African people. It is by engaging in this type of investigative activity that our people, African people, will discover one day that the Egyptian, Kemetic, Nubian civilization played the same role according to African culture as did the so-called Greco-Latin antiquity is in regards to Western civilization. And let's just end with this. This is the day that uh, there's going to be a boxing match this evening. It is going to be between Floyd Mayweather and Colin McGregor. In order to understand the greatness of Mayweather, you also have to understand the greatness of another brother by the name of Sugar Ray Leonard. 
But to understand Sugar Ray Leonard, you would also have to understand who Sugar Ray Robinson was. You would have to understand who Muhammad Ali was, but not just that. To understand Floyd Mayweather, as it relates to boxing, now we can do this in every subject. So this is not just I'm taking boxing singularly. We can do this in science, arts, whatever, geography, history. What I'm saying is that to understand the present, you have to understand the past in order to understand who's coming after Floyd Mayweather. So to study this fight today with Floyd Mayweather is not just to study Floyd Mayweather. It is to study where Floyd Mayweather came from and who will be following in Floyd, Floyd Mayweather's footsteps. You have to understand Muhammad Ali. I'm just coming from Louisville. Powerful experience. The home. I visited uh, Muhammad Ali's home while there. I have it all on DVD. Muhammad Ali, who said that knowledge of history leads to self-respect. Muhammad Ali. But to understand Muhammad Ali, you have to understand Joe Lewis. And to understand Joe Lewis, you have to understand Jack Johnson. But to understand Jack Johnson, you have to understand the Nubian warriors of the ancient world who understood what you do when you are serious about your freedom. They do a physical. There's also a mental and a spiritual and a soulful revolution occurring where we have to free ourselves. So I often think of Harriet Tubman, who was the conductor of the Underground Railroad that freed our bodies. I consider myself a conductor on the Inner Ground Railroad that's attempting to free our African minds. And to do that, we have to study history. The next time we're together, family, and I'll be putting posts up when we'll do this episode number three, we're going to be looking at language. But right now, the importance of history. And I'd like to end with Professor John Henrik Clark's statement on history that I heard him say. He said that history is like a clock that people use to tell their political time of day. He said that history was a compass that people used to find themselves on the map of human geography. Family, we have to live no distractions. Keep your eye on what it is that you need to do. Keep on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. Hotep. Hotep family, Kaba Hiawatha. As you know, we've been doing uh, these episodes um, on uh, Saturdays. And this is what we're calling series one. And it's focusing on an overview, I think, at least, of where we need to be going uh, here now in 2017, uh, approaching the uh, first fifth of the 21st century. There are things we need to, to know. I'm looking at the work of, um, for instance, episodic and holistic uh, history coming from a comparative analysis. And what we did in episode one we spoke about episodic and corrective history. We spoke about something that Dr. Sheikhant Diop wrote in his book, Civilizational Barbarism, uh, in his chapter on why cultural identity, because that's where we really should start. Um, why cultural identity? That, as I said before, is one of the questions I always get from uh, people, but particularly children. And children in their purest form want to know certain things. They want answers. And so when we look at why cultural identity, Dr. Diop says, of course, there are three factors. And one of them is what we spent time last episode on, which was um, the three things that people take from you when they want to oppress you. And it doesn't make a difference what your culture. It has to do with just human beings on human beings who have come to a level of consciousness and understanding. And Dr. Diop says they will take your history, they will take your language, and they will take your psychological factor. Your psychological factor, as we see it defined by Dr. Leonard Jeffries, is your values, your interests, and your principles, what he calls your VIPs. Last episode, we spoke about the importance of history. This episode, I'd like to talk about the importance of language. And not just that, but look towards the future as to how to approach this concept of language. I'd like to take some of the writings from uh, Dr. Um, Shekhante Diop in his chapter, Why Cultural Identity, 
I'd like to take some excerpts from another uh, brilliant scholar, Congolese scholar by the name of Dr. Fukia. And Dr. Fukia wrote a book that I used uh, in my classes on, on Congolese cosmology. But in that, he speaks of the, un the understanding and the importance of language. And I also want to talk about uh, a book that was written relating to Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek and, philosoph uh, and philosophy. It, it was entitled the, Ras the Wrath of Kant, Eberl, and Decker. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that there was a particular episode in Star Trek that I use to talk about the deciphering of Medunetel, or what the Greeks called hieroglyphics. It was called uh, the Children of Tarma. And it's uh, very interesting because of the concept of ta Tamar, Tamarians, and Tamar or Tameri, meaning uh, the, uh, the beautiful land, uh, the united land, of which Tameri was one of the names that was given to Egypt originally. So Tamerians was a very interesting concept. But I want to do all of this in relationship to um, language and then talk about some things that we can actually do. And Dr. Diop says, first of all, in terms of defining linguistics or language, uh, he says that for human beings, from the moment that a human being became conscious and realized the importance of the person, the place, or the event that they were experiencing. From that point that they invented a technique, oral, written, or bodily, um, was the moment that language came into existence. And not only that, but wanted to transmit or communicate this person, place, or event from one person to another. Um, there is a uh, philosopher by the name of Montesquieu that he, uh, that Dr. Diab quoted when he says, as long as a conquered people has not lost their language, they have hope for redemption, emancipation, and liberation. Because language is the unique common denominator, the characteristic of cultural identity, the cultural common sense of the people, and their movement towards excellence. It is therefore a necessity that a common African language unify its people. Here, I'm going to just say it. I'm going to get more into it as we get to the end of this uh, episode. But I am recommending that we, the African diaspora, embrace Medunetel or hieroglyphs as the classical African language. What Dr. Diop and other scholars have said, such as uh, Dr. Anderson Thompson and uh, Dr. Marulana Karenga, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben, Dr. Sharshi McIntyre, Dr. Jeannie Bain, Jerry Price. I could go through the list. Time doesn't allow me to do that, but they've all agreed that Medunetta or hieroglyphs, and when we are able to decipher the Marotic script that comes from Meroe or Nubia, we've, we've not yet found what they call the Rosetta Stone of the Marotic language that we find spoken in Kush. We haven't yet found it. But there are many scholars, and I've met some in Egypt, that are working on deciphering the Marotic script. But for now, realistically, we do have Medunetta, and we have scholars uh, that do it. And there's a lot more work that has to be done. Uh, in no way is it the final, but just the fact that we as African people are embracing it tells us that we're on the right road. It must become our classical language, and that Medunetta and the Marotic script, spoken in Kush, is to African people what Greek and Roman script is to Western civilization. It must be the base of our language understanding. I'm also recommending that Kiswahili, the language spoken in Kenya, Tanzania, and parts of Congo, the central Great Lakes region, also be our practical spoken language. And there will be reasons why at the end of the presentation we talk about this. But it becomes important that we understand that the linguistic unity of Africans creates a cultural identity and a cultural common sense as to how we decipher what we're experiencing and what we want to experience. Uh, it's, um, it's very necessary for a total recasting of the African psychological program of education in all fields. And it must be centered in the comedic legacy, because that is where we have the greatest writings of inner African mindset, and that will create the African cultural personality or the cultural identity. According to Dr. Fukia, 
Um, Africans love the study of language. Uh, we are, as Dr. Uh, Asa Hilliard, Nana before, once, once told us that um, figurative language, figurative language includes metaphor, simile, personification, foreshadowing, uh, symbolism. Um, all of those represent, uh, he said, they are ubiquitous to the African psychology. In other words, figurative language, even if you look at hip hop today and you look at rap, which is the vocalization of it, you can see that the, the, those that are engaged in rap literally have created a, a, a form of an African language, a way in which it's symbolisms, it's, it's uh, metaphors, it's similes. You know, what's interesting is that uh, because I've always worked with children and because of my own biological children growing up in this age of rap, I've always been exposed to it in one way or another throughout my day. And I've learned a lot about the symbolism of rap music as, it's, as, as it relates to language today. And I've noticed that when my children or the children I've been around have given me what they call the 411. See, for us, 411 is what you call on the phone for information. 411 is when they give you information about whatever is going on. They're going to give you the 411. Uh, for a person of another generation or a person not exposed to the symbolism of Medunetta or their Medunetta or rap music, you might not know what that means. You could be in a room and young people and elderly people could be talking and the elder people have no idea what the uh, younger people are talking about because they have not decoded it. And that's what uh, Dr. Fukia is talking about when he talks about African languages. And he talks about it the order in order to improve the scientific capacity within the mind of African people. We have to study and speak in the language that is indigenous to our DNA structure. To study this language is the most important process of learning because it is the art of coding and decoding social systems of the human society in the world. Learning is an accumulative process of coding and decoding cultures. Therefore, it is necessary to study the language that expresses these cultures. One has to learn the art of coding in order to understand the opposite side of all things that are going on. How to uh, untie or decode uh, is uh, important to understand the social and conceptual systems that are being created. Um, and uh, he says that Cong Congolese proverbs and principles state, a community's codes and its decodes by its members creates a system that only can be understood by its members. A systematic understanding of language therefore is possible only if one can taste and feel the radiation and the beauty of the language that generates that particular culture. Now to look at Star Trek and the idea of uh, this particular segment that was called uh, the children uh, of, of, of Tom Mary. Um, he cites certain concepts that I think is very interesting. Dramas are set in the language of the audience, not the land in which the activity is taking place. So when we look at the Asarian drama that was, that was given to us by the comedic ancestors, which is at the root of all drama, it is the root of all stories. It is in the root of every holy book that exists. The Asarian drama. Uh, if you want to see a, a concept of the Asarian drama in today's world, I often tell our children. In uh, fact, my daughter once did a paper in college on the relationship between the Asarian drama. She was in black studies. Uh, she spoke about the relationship between the Asarian drama and the present day uh, movie uh, that is called The Lion King because The Lion King is another version of the Asarian drama told in another story. And so the Asarian drama, while we may say it in the English language, the psychology of the Asarian drama is based on a universal principle that at one time was presented in Kemet, in the language, in the psychology of the ancient Kemites. You, ha you have to learn to understand what objects and what words signify in language. Words give a particular picture of the essence of the language. Every word has a meaning, and this meaning is correlated with a word. 
The object is what the word stands for. <clears throat> St. Augustine, who was one of the early Christian fathers, African, who uh, began to translate the, the traditional African symbolism into the current, or at that time, the current Catholic Church, uh, he wrote the book, uh, The Confessions. St. Augustine said that the learning of language is like a child who comes into a strange country and did not understand the language. It already had her or his own language, but not the language of the new country. Think of African people coming to America. Think of all of the African people stolen from Africa and were introduced to European languages and also to indigenous languages that were here. They came with their own language, with their own psychological factor, but is now being immersed in another set of languages. The holistic approach begins with larger units of significance out of which separate words are only gradually articulated. This is how we learn language. So when we're going back to learn African languages, we have to take the reverse path that we took to get to speaking English. What language did we speak? Language and life are inseparable. To imagine a language means to imagine a form of life. This is what Dr. Diop means when he says that when someone takes your language, they take your life. So we have to understand the importance. For instance, all of us, come from different backgrounds. He talks about a lion, okay? The cat, the lion. If lions could talk, we probably wouldn't be able to understand them because humans and lions represent different forms of life. For instance, a lion, the olfactory, the sense of smell is very important because lions and cats depend on their smell to be able to live. Much of their smell and olfactory deal with this. For those of you who are Trekkies, you know Klingons. Klingons were a warrior people. All of their language was based in war. The words they used even in love had to do with war. The way they interacted with each other dealt with war. So much of what they were dealing with. So who we are as a people come from that. So when you come from a person to person axiology, as Dr. Edwin Nichols tells us, and you are sub submersed in a civilization that is materially uh, based, you're changing your entire life structure. The words that you use have a lot to do with monetary gain. It ha has to do with material wealth, as opposed to coming from a culture that speaks of nature, and that nature and interactions with each other are the primary source of life. You are now dealing in a situation where it's about money. Words are deeply rooted in a people's distinctive culture. Their specific culture and mythology shapes the categories in which they understand their world. Okay. To go back to study this does not mean you have to give up what you have. It means that you have to add on to your already acquired understanding and knowledge. Now, Medunera. Medunera is a pictographic symbolic language. It is a language that at its base represents, for instance, the sound M, M is an owl. The sound Ak, Ak is a vulture. The letter N is wavy lines. So that to, uh, to understand Meduneta, we have got to go back to understand the deeper concepts of what they represented. Here in the Bronx, we don't have many owls. So my daily life is not based around seeing an owl and having that owl somehow impress upon me who or what they are. In Kemet, owls were very important. They're not the smartest bird, but from my research, owls have the ability to turn their head almost completely around, if not completely around, which to a person looking at the owl from a metaphoric perspective, the owl has the ability to see all of its surroundings. So our ancestors said, wow, that's great. I wish I had that. I wish I had the ability to see all angles of things. The owl also has the ability to see in the dark. So our ancestors from a metaphoric perspective said, wow, that's great. Imagine what it would be if I could actually see truth in darkness. 
if I could perceive light in dark. So the owl came to represent intelligence. It wasn't the most intelligent bird, but symbolically, metaphorically, using it as a simile, an owl was like being wise. An owl was wise. For those of us that go back that far, for those of us who ate wise potato chips, what was the symbol of the uh, wise potato chip? It was an owl. When you go back to graduating from school, what always had the graduation cap on? It was always an owl. What's the symbol of graduation? It's an owl. Well, that comes from Kemet, the concept of being wise, the metaphor of being able to see all angles of things and being able to see truth in darkness. That became a metaphor. But if you're growing up in a, in a world that in your immediate uh, uh, surroundings don't have an owl, you're not going to create that. That doesn't mean that you don't have some type of symbol in your environment that you're not going to use for wise. It just means that you don't have that particular symbol. So that it becomes important that we look at Medunera as a base of an African cultural common sense, as a base, and begin to develop an understanding of that. And so Medunera, for us as African people, should become the classical African language. Now, the practical spoken language. I am recommending there are many languages that are good, and I'm not going to say which one should, but Kiswahili should become the practical language. If I go to Brazil and brothers and sisters speak Portuguese, I speak English, we should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. If I go to Holland and brothers and sisters speak Dutch, we should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. If I go to Puerto Rico, we should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. It will be the unifying language. It's that language that's going to unify us. All the languages, Twa, Twi, all of the languages, Yoruba, Igbo, they're all good. But even Kwanzaa is based in Kiswahili language spoken in Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, Congo. It is at the base of the original African language uh, uh, means of communication. And so Kiswahili, first of all, is the largest African language spoken in the world. Kiswahili is the seventh spoken in the world. And Kiswahili has been adapted by the United Nations as one of the official languages spoken. So let's look at that. Build all the African languages, but let's begin with that. Now to do that, as we wrap this up, what I would like to tell you is that I'm encouraging you, and again, I know that there are many other organizations that are teaching languages, African languages. I'd like to just start us off in a place that I know. As it relates to Medunetta, I know that a brilliant sister by the name of Dr. Riketi Wimby you can uh, Google her. You can R-K-H-T-Y-W-I-M-B-Y, Riketi Wimby. She's on the internet. She, often, she writes books on Medunetta. She has a children's books on Medunetta. Uh, she has classes on Medunetta. I also encourage to go to Abibi Tumikasa, A-B-I-B-I-T-U-M-I-K-A-S-A dot com. That once again is for Riketi Wimby. R-K-H-T-Y-W-I-M-B-Y. And for Kiswahili, Riketi is for Medunera and the importance of language. This next one is for Kiswahili. I even got Congolese language from them. They have a class on uh, Twi and all many languages. A-B-I-B-I-T-U-M-I-K-A-S-A dot com. Family, we'll be back next week. Next week, we're going to tie this up with the psychological factor, the importance of the psychological factor, the values, interests, and principles of African people that we have to return back to, and how we have begun to look at developing this from a very real sense. I also want to let you know that you can uh, download my free e-course at www.kabakamene.com. I'm, I'm at my 5,000 mark in, uh, on my Facebook page, but you can follow me, and I put up a lot of information there at Kaba Kamene, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E. -E. I also have two other pages. One is uh, dealing with 
education, and that is Panther Prince Per Unc, four words. P-A-N-T-H-E-R, P-R-I-N-C-E, P-E-R, A-N-K-H. And you can also go to Professor Kaba, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-K-A-B-A, where I put up a lot of other information dealing specifically with some of the work that I'm doing and moving forward. I'd, I'd like to wrap this up, uh, family, because I want to, first of all, I want to thank all of you who have downloaded uh, my free e-course on Spirituality Before Religions, and I thank you all for your support uh, over time. Um, it has meant a great deal uh, in terms of the work that we're doing. As I've told you, um, I, I promised that I was going to get my tech skills together. And through the help of my son, Heru, and uh, Philippe Matthews, who has brought me through my marketing mind, we have been able to develop this. And so I really appreciate all that you do to support me. And I appreciate you. Um, if you download my materials, you will see that there are materials that there is no price for. Uh, there are materials that there is a price for and there's a plus sign. And some of you have been extremely generous in, in, give, in giving to me more than what I'm asking for. The materials that I put out there is for the community. And I realize the times we're going through right now, I realize that what could be one person's $1 might be another person's $10, could be another person's $100. But this information is too important to make money the bottom line for getting it to you. And what I've begun doing now is I'm learning how to put my, my DVDs and my presentations on uh, streaming which has allowed me to bring the price down even further than when you get the physical copy of it. And I will continue to do the best I can to ensure that the very best materials, the work that I'm doing, can get to you at a price that is convenient and comfortable for our family because we have to move forward. And I've often said that if Harriet Tubman had charged admission for the Underground Railroad, a lot of us would not be free. It's not about the money. It's about the information. But in today's world, whatever monetary gain I do have, it allows me to improve my work, purchase the books and other materials I need to come before you with the type of scientific knowledge and wisdom that we need to go into the 21st century for. Our children and those yet to be born deserve the very best. And we are the best of the best. We have come from the pyramids, gone to the plantation, living in the projects, but we're on our way to the promised land. And if we just keep on keeping on, family, we're going to make this happen. So next Saturday, we're going to meet again. Same time, same place. And we're going to talk about the importance of the psychological factor. Our values, our interests, and our principles. Keep on keeping on, family. It ain't over till we win. Otep family, Kaba Hiawatha. As you know, we've been doing uh, this series, No Distractions. And uh, we've been looking at the three things that people take from you when they wish to oppress you. Using the work of Dr. Sheikh Antadiyat with the interpretations of Yalenge and just bringing together other research. I wanted to spend today looking at the third thing that someone will impact. The first, the first thing that we spoke about was history, that people will take your history from you. The next thing we spoke about is people will take your language from you. And this one we're dealing with the psychological factor. And one of the important things to understand is that history and language are two coordinates. They're, they're, they're points of reference upon which your psychological factor is built. And um, your VIPs, as Dr. Jeffries calls it, your values, your interests, and your principles are developed around your psychological factor. But to bring it all together, uh, it's, it's important to know that, you know, as it relates to prehistory and history, uh, prehistory is, is through time. We don't really know the dates. It could be much older than we think, but the idea is that uh, you leave prehistory behind from the moment that uh, you become conscious of the importance of whatever the historical event is, and that you are able to develop and use a language, oral or written, that will transmit, explain what happened and why it happened 
and invent techniques to remember and to act on that particular event. The psychological factor includes the memorization and the accumulation of memories in order to act on the experience and teach all those experiences to the children with the idea that every perfect society is geared towards improving the future. The only way to improve the future is by transmitting information to children because they are your future. And uh, Dr. Diop says that all peoples have their own sense of virtue, whereas the other two factors, the historic and the linguistic, are susceptible only to the scientific approach. Historical and linguistic factors constitute coordinates, as, as, we, as we said before. But the most important thing is that they relate to, language and history relate to, the permanent understanding of that particular psychological factor. Psychological factors include your values, interests, and principles. And they are the uh, points of reference of a people who view these VIPs from their own cultural common sense. That becomes extremely important. Because when you're looking at the world from someone else's values, interests, and principles, there's no way that you could become balanced with yourself in order to understand who you are because you're looking at the world through someone else's eyes. So it becomes important to understand what Dr. Theofalio Benger calls a cultural common sense, your view of the world from your own cultural perspective. However, people cannot have a cultural common sense if they view the world from another person's conceptual, cultural, common sense. Now, in order to understand this in the world that we're living in today, what I'd like to do is look at the psychological factors, look at the VIPs, and break it down into another type of intelligence. And that's the intelligence of the mind. And I'm looking at basically two concepts. One of them is respect. Your values and interests and principles are based on respect. And the other aspect I'd like to look at is uh, ethics. Now, when we break it down from a comedic perspective, what we see is that that ma'at is ethics. It's what we call moral exaltations. And, and, and they're based on, on thinking. Ethics is based on thinking, developing a moral exaltation. Exaltation means to what you exalt, what you hold to be very important to you. Uh, what you prioritize in your daily life. Now, Ma'at was represented by an ostrich feather. Her mate, as it relates to what could be a, a, a husband and wife, she, Ma'at being the wife, was married to, or who is her counterpart, is Tehuti. Tehuti was an Ibis bird. Basically, uh, when, you, when you look at the world out here today, it would be a crane and it, it's just you know so it's so interesting when you look at the animal world and how our ancestors use different animals to represent different concepts of the creator's creations tehuti represents respect that is the an intellectual illumination or the act on what you respect so you have respect and you have ethics you have Tehuti and you have Ba'at, but Tehuti can only exist in the presence of Ma'at, and Ma'at can only exist in the presence of Tehuti. So we have moral exaltation precedes intellectual illumination. So we are living in a world now where we have people who are uh, intelligent and they range in age. To the African tradition, the elder was the most revered of everybody. So the idea of moral exaltation precedes intellectual illumination. Basically, it means it doesn't make, make a difference how intelligent you are, but if you're not moral in your grounding, then it doesn't make a difference what you know. And we're living in a very interesting world where people who are young um, can have a great deal of financial uh, reward. Uh, they, they can have all the things that life should have, and you have elders that are barely making it. Well, from an African universal cosmic reality, that 
can't happen. But in the world we're living in today, it can. L let's talk about a little bit of uh, Tehuti. Let's, let's talk about in intellect. Let's talk about how we feel as it relates to uh, how we act. Respect. The world of today and tomorrow is becoming increasingly diverse. And there is no way to cut yourself off from this diversity. Accordingly, we must respect those who differ from us as well as those with whom we have similarities. Now, I know this might call to mind the idea that I'm speaking about cultures, but I'm really talking about people in general. As it relates to even within a particular cultural group, there are different ways of looking at the world. And so basically what I'm saying is that respect is the ability for us to understand that we're all not the same, that we all have our own ways of doing what it is that we have to do. And if you look at the troubles of the world today, if you look at white fragility, what you're basically looking at is a cultural group with a total lack of respect, not just for other people, but even for themselves. And it becomes important that we understand this. No matter how they may be presenting themselves, respect is extremely important. To have a respectful mind, to think respectfully, it welcomes differences between human individuals and between human groups. It tries to understand the others and seeks to work effectively with them. And in a world where we're all interlinked, intolerance or disrespect is no longer a viable option. The world is much too big for this at this point. Individuals without respect will not be worthy of respect by others and will poison wherever they go, whether it be the workplace, the home, or the school. The respectful mind responds sympathetically and empathetically, and it constructively understands the differences among individuals and among people, seeking to understand and work with those who are different, extending beyond mere tolerance and political correctness. Now, as you are listening to me talk, look and think about values, interests, and principles as it relates to respect. You can listen to music. What are you listening to in the music? Look at the way in which people dress. What are you looking as it relates to dress? Now, what's important to understand is, as I talk about this idea of dress, it's important to understand that I'm not speaking about being fully clothed or not having many, many clothes on because you can go to parts of uh, the warm climates, Africa included, South America, Australia, where men and women walk with very little clothing on. So it's not so much the amount of clothing you have on, it's what's on your mind when you observe people as they are dressed a certain way. And, and what we're looking at today is the fact that there is just very little respect, particularly for women. But for men too and so it becomes very important that when we're looking at our values our interests and our principles that we look at them with a very clear mind and, and and not become confused with what we're talking about not not getting it twisted now one of the things to to, to look at as we move through this process of the psychological factor the values interests, and principles now is now to move towards ethics Ethics is carrying out the rules of respect that you live by. As workers and as citizens, we need to be able to ethically think, to go beyond our own self-interest and to do what is right under the circumstances. More abstract than the respectful mind is the ethical mind, which ponders the nature of one's work and the needs and desires of the society in which you live. This mind, the ethical mind, conceptualizes how workers can best serve purposes beyond self-interest and how citizens of the world work unselfishly to improve the lot of all. The ethical mind then acts on the basis of these analyses. The ethical mind is an individual who tries to understand his or her 
role as a citizen, as a family member, as a mate, what should be expected? So it becomes important that everyone should be able to pose and answer the same set of questions with regard to his or her own occupational place in the world. Good work, excellent, and engaging for all, which is ma'at. Individuals without ethics will yield a world devoid of decent workers and responsible citizens. Just look around us today. Because really what all this is about, this series is about, is about building a better tomorrow for us as a people. But to us and for us as African people to look at these concepts, moving away just from constantly using the word African. Really what we have to look at is use the word universal because we are the only people on the planet. One race, human race, born, raised, nurtured, sustained in Africa. Diversifies as this African person, male and females, travels across the globe and is impacted by his or her presence or lack of presence of the sun in their life. They changed physically, morphologically, body size changes. So in order to answer these questions, we really do have to go back to the original. We have to go back to the archetype of humanity. And what we're talking about here is what our ancestors talked about as they were traversing along the Hopi Valley, the Nile Valley, going from the central part of Africa to the north, the central part of Africa to the south. So it's important that as we go to regain our consciousness, we begin to understand what it is that we have to do. Individuals without ethics will yield a, a world devoid of de decent workers. You'll always be looking for a quicker way. I, I think of people that I've seen who have, who have won the lotto, quick money, and they say the first thing that they're gonna do is quit their job. Uh, I know for a fact that person will never really truly find their happiness. They'll, they'll be able to substitute happiness for money, but they will never find their own personal happiness. Because I can honestly tell you that if I should hit the lotto, I would just become a rich teacher. But I would never stop what I'm doing. This is a passion. This is my life. This is my purpose. And I wish, and I wish on all of us what I feel to find your passion. Find what makes you who you are, you know, with that gift that the Creator has given you, and to build on it. And, and out of that comes a work ethic, a way in which you want to build your work around, around your belief system and begin to carry out it in a way that is very clear. Remember that ma'at ethics, you know, is what you think, and respect is how you carry out or how you do what you think. And so it becomes important um, to understand and there's a, Native, there's a Native American proverb and it said, we began to win against the pale face when we learned how to lie effectively. Now, on one level, of course, that's good, but on another level, it means that a person who lives an ethical, respectful life has to go against their core belief system in order to survive, in order to thrive. And that's very sad when you think that someone has to do that because you really should be able to stay who you are, but unfortunately you can't. And we find ourselves as African people having to stoop beneath our core value system, our core interests and principles that we live by, justice, reciprocity, balance, harmony. In order to survive, there are times that we have to move away from that. And while I'm not saying don't do that, I'm saying if you do have to do that, do that realizing it's only to meet a goal. 
to survive. And it is not the way of life that you should take because if you should ad adapt that way of living and get in too deep and start living like that, when you don't have to live like that, when you have to be with people and treat them, even though they don't deserve it, like you've learned how to treat other people, then it puts you in a certain situation. As Malcolm spoke about the difference between violence and self-defense, he said, I'm not violent. He said, but if, if, if I have to get involved physically against someone who wishes to do me harm, I don't call that violence. He says, I call that intelligence. And that's what he meant by self-defense. So that as we're looking at respect and as we're looking at ethics, as we're beginning to develop and understand our values, interests, and principles, to understand ma'at, ma'at is universal. There is no way that you can move beyond ma'at. She is yesterday, she is today, and she will forever be. She is the balance of the cosmic universe. She is what brought things into being. She is the path of justice and righteousness. And as Dr. King said, although sometimes the arc of the moral universe is long, it does bend towards justice. And justice will be served. It may not be in the time we want it to be served, but it will be served. And so I encourage us, as we look at this third factor, values, interests, and principles, uh, to understand that when you do adapt the values, interests, and principles of those who would wish to oppress you, always understand that it is only to survive and not to thrive, because you will not thrive with the types of values, interests, and principles of white fragility, because white fragility is based in insecurity and a deep inferiority complex, which is living and understanding that, as Dr. Francis Quest Welsing says, that uh, there is a genetic annihilation. There is a scientific principle that says what goes around comes around. You shall reap what you sow. And so it becomes important that as we move forward and we put an end to this faction and what we do have to go back to, we have to return back to our respect and our ethics and make that the core base for everything that we do. Malcolm was not violent, but he did decide he was going to defend himself. Self-defense is not violence, it's intelligence. So it becomes important as we start to develop these ideas and these concepts that we understand that you take the best and you leave the rest. You take the sense out the nonsense and just keep on moving. It becomes important that we understand this. We'll, uh, be going Facebook Live next week. Uh, we are not going to do a part of the series. We're going to continue the series uh, probably two weeks after that because I will be visiting our community uh, in Orlando, Florida, but we'll be doing some Facebook Living there also. So I always plan to do some form of Facebook Live, but we're going to continue the series when I come back the following week. And uh, what I'd like to tell the family is that um, we are uh, on. Um, we are on a, a website, www.kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com, and we offer a free e-course for those of you who are interested. And we also have our study guide uh, because we need to go beyond just what we're experiencing, and I want you to have the types of materials that you need. So we'll be going um, on this website. And you, you put your um, email in, and then you'll start to get over six days, uh, a, a lesson a day that you can look at at your convenience. We also have started to stream. And what's important about my streaming, um, many of my presentations, is the fact I've always tried to bring, I'm speaking financially now, I've, I've always tried to bring my prices down. And there are two ways that you can, you have, well, there are three ways you have access to the DVD. You either have the physical copy, you can stream it, or you can rent the stream. And the reason why is because some of us may not have enough room on our computer, so it's better to rent. Some of us want to be able to see it over and over again, so I want you to be able to stream it. But I have been able to take the price to a point where I think it's convenient for, for our community. 
uh, and I'm going to start a series starting very soon on the Dogon. I already have some streaming up right now. So when you go to the site, www.kabakamane.com, you'll, you'll get a sense of what's going on. But I'm going to start to put a DVD on the Dogon. The, the, the Dogon is a very important lesson. It has a lot to teach us as it relates to our original thought of how the universe came into being. And through my research, I've come to realize that the Dogon took what the Kemites were doing to the next level. And so my interest in the Shabaka Stone became my interest in the Dogon people. And just to show you how close this concept is as it relates to the Dogon people, there was uh, an individual that we are very familiar with, most of us are, who belonged to the Dogon people. His grandfather's uh, African name, coming from this part of Africa known as Mali, was Banaka. And when we look at what the Dogon are known for, and when we look at what Benjamin Banaka was known for, we notice it was the same. Agriculture and astronomy, but more importantly, being able to relate the two together and blend them and synthesize their importance. As above, so below. As in the heavens, so as it is on earth. And Benjamin Banneker really was the architect for Washington, D.C. They give the credit to Pierre L'Enfant, the Frenchman, because they don't want to give it to the African. But whoever built Washington, D.C., whoever laid it out, had to have been an astronomer, not just an engineer, but an astronomer. Benjamin Banaka was an astronomer and he was an agriculturalist. He's also given credit for having developed um, the more advanced clock in the United States. And he's also responsible for developing the first farmer's almanac. So as you're looking at your weather report on television and they're telling you what the weather was decades ago, you can thank Benjamin Banneker because he was the one that started keeping records. And the reason why he could keep records was because in his DNA, he had the Dogon philosophy of the invisible star, the Kizzy Uzi. So we'll be talking about this in the DVDs that, that we'll be coming up with. I did a seven part series in Harlem here in New York on the Dogon. And I will be releasing DVDs stream wise and the physical copy over the next few weeks. So be on the lookout for that. Be on the lookout for the work that we're doing. And uh, let's get serious about getting serious, family. Uh, in your neighborhoods where you have those brothers and sisters with their small businesses, whatever they may be selling, the merchants that you pass on the street, put 10% of your net income away. Spend it with your people. They are our small businesses. They need your support. But you can start with 10%. Let's just start there. And let's begin this process of reaching back into the community and bring wealth back to our community and to the businesses that are in the street of African descent. Let's us start to do good business with our community. We're living in very challenging times. The idea is to bring the price down so that our community can afford it and be able to also take care of themselves and their family. So next week, family, we will be, um, coming to you from Newark, New Jersey, with uh, class number three of West Africa. And we'll be developing the kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and we'll do a little talking about the great things that were going on in Nigeria. Have a great week. Keep on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. Shemem Hotep. Amun is satisfied.